Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's been a long day with a, with a lot of uh, intensive uh, uh, thinking that you've all been doing, so I'm glad that some of you managed to make it through to the, to the end. And uh, so I'm, what am I going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about, it's a big set of words here, economically expediting computationally intensive problems. That's quite a mouthful. Uh, but I'll explain more about that, what it is, in a minute. First, uh, just a little introduction uh, to myself and my, and my business partner, unfortunately, could not be here because he's traveling. Uh, we're both uh, corporate junkies for 20 years, and then uh, about three years ago, we decided to start this madcap venture called Grid Markets, uh, which I'll be uh, telling you about. Um, behind us, obviously, we have an amazing team of engineers and advisors without which uh, this would not have been possible. So, um, and of course, we are hiring. If anybody does know anybody, please go to gridmarkets.com slash hiring, and uh, you'll find some positions there. But back to the plot. What are we talking about computationally intensive problems? But well, this is a selection of example use cases of problems that, re that require or would benefit from having large amounts of computational power thrown at them. So literally, we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands, of servers to make these kinds of things uh, you know, happen more quickly. Um, many of these you'll be familiar with, but I'm going to talk about, initially talk about one that's kind of esoteric, really. And that's in the area of uh, radiation therapy for cancer treatment. So um, I don't know if you've seen this uh, machine over here on the, on the left here, but basically it fires radiation, radio waves, into you and, and basically do, do the crossing of waves at certain points, it will burn a tumor in whatever part of your body it's uh, pointed at. But obviously a tumor is a very irregular shape. So in fact, they have to calculate based on the scans that they make of your body and where the tumor is, approximately how much space it's actually occupying. Now clearly, the, the more accurate that measurement is, and the finer grained you can actually get down the cutting, because the actual beam itself can be very, very focused to, to nanometers, but just figuring out where to fire in the first place is actually the difficult bit, and where not to fire. Because obviously, you don't want to be killing perfectly good cells, which, for example, if it's in your brain, is not a good place to, to be doing that, right? So, um, and you guessed it, this is a very computationally intensive problem. And the more machines that you can throw at this problem, the more accurate can be your model, and the less brain cells you'll be killing in the process. So that's a kind of a very esoteric example. But I'm going to talk about something that is uh, something hopefully you can relate to um, a lot better. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Moore's Law, which shows that computational power increases every, uh, uh, doubles basically every couple of years. Um, but I'm going to introduce you now to Shrek's Law. Now, this is a real um, a term invented by DreamWorks and Intel. DreamWorks works, works very closely with Intel, which shows the increase in demand in compute power in producing each of the Shrek movies. As you can see, each one was produced three years apart. Each one required twice the processing power of the previous one, except for the last one, which required 25% more again because it was in 3D. Now, one thing to point out here is this is on top of Moore's Law. So in fact, since compute power is increasing during this entire process, the machines that were used for the last movie were literally 20 to 30 times the speed of the machines that were used for the first one. So as you can see, there is an exponential growth in the demand. And just to give you an idea, um, uh, Monsters University, if any of you saw that, was 100 million hours, okay? Now, if you keep going with this, and eventually, you know, obviously we're getting higher frame rates, we're getting uh, more uh, complex models, we're getting higher resolutions. This could just keep escalating to the point where you could literally be looking at a billion uh, uh, CPU hours. And again, on top of the natural growth in compute power. And clearly this becomes a bit of a problem. Now I'm talking about millions of hours and billions of hours, but what, is this, what does this actually mean? So, um, how many of you have uh, seen, this, seen this movie, Hugo? Uh, it was the 2012 um, uh, Ac Academy Award winner for, special, uh, for visual effects. And this is the beginning of the, of the movie. There's about a minute and a half, I'm not gonna show you the whole thing. Beautiful flyover of Paris, looks very nice. 
as you can see, snow falling. In fact, the most complex part of the scene, believe it or not, is actually modeling the snow. This scene took 150,000 hours to do, just a minute and a half, okay? And costs 35,000 US dollars in electricity alone. Each time that they ran it. So they probably ran this like three or four times to actually get the final effect. And as you can see, that all clearly becomes a very expensive proposition. This is one movie, one and a half minutes, and this was two, almost three years ago when they actually produced it. So this clearly becomes an enormous problem, even for the largest studios or the largest engineering houses or whatever. They may have the budget to go do it, but this even becomes technically and operationally a very difficult thing to do. And for small and medium-sized enterprises who are potentially trying to compete with these large, uh, well-capitalized companies, this becomes almost a barrier to entry. And this is across 100 or so use cases. I, I showed some at the beginning. This is a, a further list that shows you there are so many different aspects uh, in various different industries all over the world that require this amount of computational power. So herein lies a problem. And just to give you an idea of what we estimate the demand for such a, such a capacity would be, is anywhere from about 10 to $100 billion, right? Just remember that $35,000 just in electricity and doubling every three to five years, right? So this is an exponential growth and there is no upper bound to the demand. The models will never get less complicated. The problems will never get less complicated. But here's the paradox of the situation. Most servers in the world are extremely underutilized. Does anybody want to have a guess how much the average server is actually used? I have 2%. Anyone want to? Five. Five? Anyone else? Twelve. Ha, you wish. More than 95% of it is available, unused. And in fact, more than 50% is used 0.6% of the time. So there is a colossal amount of server capacity that's out there, paradoxically. And almost 90% or more of electricity consumption in data centers is just to power these idling machines. This is clearly an enormous waste. And the fact is that this can be tapped at marginal cost because it's basically the cost of the electricity to power up the machine to be able to do more intensive tasks. So until now, there's been no way to marry this enormous demand with this enormous oversupply until now. So this is what Grid Markets is. Grid Markets is a technical platform is a legal framework and a commercial model by which institutions can trade their capacity, excess capacity with each other. Okay, so the way that this works is that the sellers operate their own machines, right, and they just provide the excess capacity. So the sellers are the primary users of it. And so for us, we're a zero capital business. We don't actually own or run any of these machines. And because there's so many servers out there doing nothing, there's practically an unlimited supply. For the buyers, it's actually a very interesting proposition because they are only paying for the hours that they actually use, right? What this means is that they're getting it for a fraction of normal cost, literally anywhere from a half to a tenth of the cost of the primary market in the cloud space, right? And there's no minimum commitment for them to go do that. So the analogy that I make to kind of describe our business is that you can buy a car, you can rent a car, you can take a taxi, which is the same as using a cloud provider, but we're not any of those things because we're a car pooling business. So the way, way we euphemistically talk about ourselves is that we're the Uber of CPU capacity. But since Uber's got a bit of bad publicity nowadays <laughs> and has been banned in a few places, um, we actually think, and actually it's a better description to say, we are actually the Airbnb of CPU capacity. <laughs> but it depends which one has the higher market valuation, which, uh, which an analogy we use. Right. So obviously one of the questions that comes up is, well, what about security? Surely, you know, these institutions, how, do you, how are they going to provide their servers? How do you know people are going to be happy with their IP being protected, sending it over to somebody else's machine? So I don't want to bore you with all the details of the technicalities of, of how we do it. But basically, there are three pillars of the security. Yes, there's a technical, which we try and safeguard the data and also the resources as much as possible. There's also the legal framework, which we spend a lot of time on figuring out what would it, would it be for people to be comfortable with trading like this. 
And most importantly, in our business model itself, is based on the concept of creating a community, and this is what we call it, is a private community of buyers and sellers of capacity where they trust their counterparties and they can choose their counterparties. So this is not just, I'm gonna send you a job somewhere into the ether. You get to choose who your counterparty is as you would in any normal trading system, okay? And it's institutional only, it's not retail, so it's not Joe Hacker using your machines or you, know, you go running on somebody's random laptop somewhere in the world, okay? People ask us, you know, well, aren't there other people doing this already? Okay, so how many of you have heard of SETI at home? Anybody? Obviously not a tech group here. So um, SETI at home was, uh, back in 97, was invented by NASA to basically go through the, uh, if you pardon the pun, the astronomical amounts of astronomical data that they had to go look for aliens. And basically, obviously, they didn't have the processing power to handle this volume of data. So you could just go onto their website and as a kind volunteer, download a piece of software and it would run on your machine, on your PC or your laptop or whatever. And while you're not using it, which is most of the time, it would calculate various things and analyze the data and send back NASA the results. There are various other versions of this, but this is clearly a volunteer program. This is retail. This is not you know, in any way competitive uh, to us. The other aspect of it is public clouds. Surely the people who are actually in the primary market are competitors of yours, no. And I think most people here are economically minded here that they understand the difference between a primary market and a secondary market, but actually that's still a problem that we have describing to tech guys because they don't really understand the difference between the two. But more importantly, the use cases are completely different. We're in the area of high throughput computing rather than high performance computing. So the primary market is for high performance computing and our market is for high throughput computing. What is the difference between the two? Best uh, uh, described with the example, high throughput computing is uh, graphics for movies and high performance computing is graphics for video games. One, the latter obviously has a real time element and when you press a button, something has to respond. Whereas what we're doing is much more like big duty batch processing. Okay? And I'm sorry, I should have mentioned they're actually our clients. The primary market guys actually provide to us because it's a way for them to recoup much of their costs from all this capacity that they can't do anything with. So what are those benefits? Well, obviously the sellers have a incredibly depreciating asset, right, which they can make available at marginal cost. So this is literally free money to them. And by the way, that isn't our term. That's actually something one of our sellers said. Is that, oh, so this is like free money. I can't do anything with this stuff. You can't store it. Even electricity, you can store a little, but you can't store processing power. Every nanosecond, it's completely wasted, right? So this is a way for them to just make, recoup their costs or make a new bit of revenue or whatever. From the buyer's point of view, it's even more interesting because not only are they able to get this at a significant discount without you know, any serious financial outlay or commitment, what this means is this is actually transformative for their businesses. This isn't just about saving money. This is about being able to do some of the core things that they do, like graphics animation or figuring out better aerodynamics on cars or whatever, and being able to do that faster or more complex things and so forth. And most importantly, that last bit at the bottom there, increasing the productivity of their knowledge workers, their most valuable asset. Okay, so whether it's their animators, their engineers, their scientists, just by being able to get their jobs done quicker, they're able to actually make them more productive, more happy and so forth. We're already a global business. This is a map that shows that we have um, opportunities and clients in multiple locations. In fact, we just when I put that public cloud out in the ocean there, that's actually Hawaii. We just signed up a uh, data center provider in Hawaii. So in summary, I just want to kind of explain what Grid Markets is. is you know, this is something that we think obviously is huge and, uh, and transformative and disruptive and with no upper bound in terms of, of the demand that's out there. And we have a really great team to go, uh, to go and execute this. So with that, I'll stop and... See if you have any questions. No questions?
So I can, I can answer that question in, in, well, I mean, as I mentioned, there are various technical things that we do to ensure the security, including using things like virtualization and making sure that uh, all the data is only pulled. And, but I don't want to get into the technical details of that. Right. So there's, but there's two fundamental aspects, I think, that, that, that kind of drive this. And one is really a market timing issue. What, before cloud computing really started to become a norm, the idea of sending your data and your processing to some data center that was being run by someone else was truly scary to most people. But through a combination of both the technology improvements and the market willingness to do that, it's in fact you know, one of the reasons why we think this is a good time for us to be doing something like this is there's already a wave of creating this kind of primary market for consumption, right? Imagine it, back in the day before there were any taxis, suddenly, you know, somebody came along with a taxi and like, well, you're going to get in a car with a complete stranger and they're going to drive you somewhere. How do you know they're not going to kill you? Or this is where the market is now, right? Five, ten years ago, it would not have been the case. That's point number one. Point number two, as I said, you get to decide. So if you don't feel comfortable, basically using someone else's machines or somebody using your machines, you don't have to let them do it. This is a open market, you know, and we don't control that. We just let people decide where, are you, where do you want to send your data, where do you want to do your processing, and who do you want to allow on your machines. And plus, we have all the legal things in place so that all the indemnities and liabilities and so forth are there as, as well. So I hope that answers your question. Echelon satellite event yes. last year. Yes. So how can this? How can we help you? Are you looking more for new customers, or are you looking for investors, or uh, what's your main pitch and what do you look from for, from for, from us? Oh, uh, all of the above, and hiring good people. Priority. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so priority. Priority at the moment. I mean, we're actually. Uh, I feel that at the moment, this is a very new concept. Okay. Just to give you an idea, Gartner estimated that the primary market. At the moment, 5% of it is brokered. Nobody's doing anything like this in the secondary market. However, I think we've got a formula that, that shows that you can actually do this technically legally and commercially that's acceptable. So we are starting to get more customers. And in fact, our main issue right now is being able to move fast enough. And so if you were to answer any of those three, I would say yes, definitely you know, some investment. And we are actually looking at potential Series A round uh, next year. Um, we are talking to a number of angel investors. We actually invested well now to the point that at our current burn rate, we have enough money to the end of next year, but we want to go faster because we know at some point this is going to appear on somebody's radar and people are going to come after us. Now, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because I'm a big believer in competition, but however, yes, we would like to go faster, so investment is one. The other is, yes, customers, if you know people who have lots of servers that they're not using, which is almost anybody who has lots of servers because they don't use them, then please let us know, one. And two, if you know people who need lots of processing power, and there are a lot of use cases, as I said, please let us know. We're uh, very interested in talking to them. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you, Hakim, for sharing us.